they uh, gave him like food and money and, and things like that. You can kind of relate it today to the fact that the uh, unsaved world uh, ministers to us. And uh, think about the roads. Think about all the roads that you travel on. A lot of those roads were built by unsaved people. And uh, you said, preacher, that's a weird way to look at it. No, uh, airplanes are made by mostly probably. I mean, there might be some Christians, you know, but mostly unsaved people in the world. In other words, you and I can use the things in the world, and they're a blessing to us, and uh, and we're dead. And so we have something that we can give them, and that's the gospel. They they don't you know they don't have the gospel. We can give them something they don't have, and that's the gospel. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 31, and they that use this world is not abusing it. And because the Gentiles or the unsaved do all these things for us Christians, what can we do for them? We've got something to give them they can't give us. We're in debt to every unsaved Jew and Gentile to give them the gospel. We, we're, we're debtors. We're, you owe a debt. I preached a message a while back on uh, this, these verses, I am debtor. I preached a message on I owe somebody something. And uh, I brought out a lot of different things. And so we, uh, you know, we live in a society where people just want to give me, give me, give me, but we owe. Verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you there at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So we ought not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Notice the I am's here. Verse 14, I am debtor. Verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready. 16, I am not ashamed. See that? 14, I am debtor. 15, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Three I am's there. All right? Now notice uh, in, fi in 15 here, he says, so as much as this in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel. Now the question comes up, what's the gospel? The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Then he said the gospel in verse 3 and 4, he goes on to say, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of of Jesus Christ. And a lot of people think the gospel is Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. That's to Jews, the unsaved house of Israel. And Mark 16.16, 16, Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. The reason why you got baptism as a part of salvation or baptism as a part of receiving the Holy Ghost is because he's still dealing with Jews. Every Orthodox Jew connects water or connects water with the purification of sin. They have the, the, the thing of purification there the Jews did. And uh, that's why Ananias, the devout Jew in Acts 22, 16, says to Saul, Why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? Those are all favorite verses of people who believe that water baptism takes away your, uh, takes away your sins. And they carefully avoid the 45 verses in the New Testament that teach that baptism is not a part of salvation. They go to three, four, five, six verses. They have nine verses they use. All right? They have nine verses they use. And five or six of them are not even talking about water baptism. When the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, that's spiritual baptism. When you get saved, God, the Lord baptizes you spiritually in the body of Christ. The problem with a lot of people is every time they see the word baptism, they think it's water. When they see the word water, they think it's baptism. That's not necessarily true. There's spirit baptism. There's, there's several different baptisms in the Bible. And... Uh, there's water baptism. There's spirit baptism. Christ said, are you able to be baptized the baptism that I'm baptized with? He's talking about his crucifixion. There's several baptisms throughout the Bible. They baptize under the cloud of Moses there in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 1 to 4. So there's different baptism. Uh, the, the, the baptism there in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Romans 6, 3. Even a lot of Baptists think that's water baptism. It's not. Once you make a water baptism, then you say water baptism puts you into Christ, which it does not. All right. Uh, though you know that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Romans 6, 3. That's, that's not water baptism. That's spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Romans 6, 3. And then there's uh, Galatians 3, uh, 27. For as many as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. 
So uh, he's talking about spirit baptism. Five or six verses that they use don't even talk about water baptism. And the other one they use in John 3, 5, when Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, they say that water is getting baptized. Uh, the water in John 3, they're talking about birth. The water there is physical birth. Even a lot of Baptists say that water is water baptism. It's not. Now, you say, well, I thought it was the Word of God. No, Ephesians 5, 26 and 27 uh, says that, uh, talks about, uh, about the washing of water by the Word uh, there, but not about the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. That's, that word, that uh, washing there, is the, uh, that is the Word of God. But in John 3, it's, it's physical birth. All right, a woman gets ready to have a baby, they say her water broke. Water is connected with physical life in the Bible. So there's another verse in John 3, 5. Uh, there's like six, six of the nine verses that they use to teach baptism saves or wash away your sins aren't even referring to water baptism. And the, the, the three or four that are, are Acts 22, 16, arise and be baptized, wash away thy sins. And Ananias says that he's a devout Jew. He has, a, he has a limited revelation at that time. He doesn't know the gospel of the grace of God. You're saved by grace through faith, without baptism, without laying on of hands, anything else. The book of Acts, a transitional book, progressive revelation. And uh, that's why Ananias says a devout Jew. That's why he says that. Then Acts 2, 38, Peter tells the house of Israel, repent and be baptized. That's water baptism. Acts 22, 16 is water baptism. And then they use 1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure whereinto baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a conscience, uh, answer of a good conscience toward God. All right, baptism there, it's talking about Noah's day. 1 Peter 3, 19 to 21. Everybody that got baptized in Noah's day drowned and went to hell. They got baptized all right, they drowned. They didn't get in the ark. You don't, you don't get saved by getting baptized. You get saved by getting in the ark. The New Testament Amen. ark is Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, everybody got baptized in Noah's day. This is just all a matter of just looking to Scripture. When you come to the Scriptures, you can't teach something that's going to bump up against 30 or 40 or 50 verses in the New Testament. See, people grab a couple, three or four verses and teach this doctrine, but it, it knocks up against 55 verses. That's not a good system of interpretation. You got to you got to say now. I know this can't teach this. I can't. Know, I know the. I know these verses here can't teach that I can lose my salvation because there's so many verses in the New Testament that says that once I'm saved, I'm always saved. So these verses have to apply to another dispensation. They have to apply to Old Testament or tribulation. When I first got saved, I'd seen the verses says, "He that overcometh." I thought overcometh. I thought I already overcame. He that shall endure unto the end, Matthew 24, 13. I have to endure unto the end. Of course, people all over churches, all over this whole area, all over the country, use those verses, all over the world. Use that verse to teach a Christian that endure unto the end or he loses salvation. Not even told by a Christian. At the time those events take place in Matthew 24, doctrinally, the church has already been raptured. Not even referring to a Christian. Referring to a Jew in the tribulation. Read in context, what Matthew 24 Pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. They're running from the Antichrist. Uh, the woe unto them that gives suck. You know, a, baby, a woman has a baby and has to feed a baby, and she, she, she ain't going to have time to do all that. She's going to have to run. Matthew 24. It's all through there. It's not talking about a Christian. That's why the Bible says, study to show thyself approved. You've got people all fouled up all over this country. <coughs> fouled up all... If the average Christian in America would spend as much time in the Bible, would spend as much time uh, in the Bible as they do on Twitter and email and on the computer, we'd have 10 billion Bible scholars in America. But they aren't going to do that. Uh, Romans 1.15, So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. So because he's a debtor, he says, I'm ready to preach the gospel. And uh, he's ready. The word ready is a familiar, uh, familiar word. I got a message I preached. I preached here, I think, a few years ago. Are you ready? Uh, Peter said, I'm ready to follow you wherever you go. In Luke 22, 33, uh, Jesus said, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. John 7, verse 6. Meaning you can die anytime. He said, my time has not yet come. 
but your time, your time to die, is all the way ready. In other words, we can die any second. But as I mentioned before, think of a man who, was, who knew when he was going to die, where he was going to die, and how he was going to die. Do you know when you're going to die? No. Do you know how you're going to die? No. Do you know where you're going to die? Do you know where you're going to be? Exactly where you're going to die? He knew he was going to die on the cross. He knew the time, and he knew the place. And he knew he was going to get tortured before he got to the cross. Think about that. What a Savior. What a Amen. Savior. Amen. He's a Savior. Uh, Paul said, What mean you to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He's ready to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 21, 13. Uh, <clears throat> Paul said, For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. 2 Timothy 4, 6. Uh, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason that I hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3, 15. Be ready to give an answer. Does that mean we have to know the whole Bible, be a Bible scholar, know every answer to every question? No. All you got to do is just tell people how you got saved. You know, that's what Paul did in the book of Acts two or three times. He gave his conversion account, how he got saved. He preached to Festus in Acts 24, King Agrippa in Acts 26. Uh, all right, uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. A lot of folks are ashamed of the Lord. They're ashamed of the gospel. Uh, Romans 5, 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So uh, Paul, Paul was not ashamed. Uh, he says over here in 2 Timothy 1, 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 12, for the, which calls also I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul says, I'm not ashamed because I know God's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. What a Savior. So, uh, uh, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. 1 Peter 4, 16. So, ashamed. Ashamed is mentioned all through the Bible. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, folks, when you give the gospel out to somebody, it isn't necessarily, it isn't really you. It's the words that you're speaking. If you're speaking the gospel, the gospel has the power of God in it. And you say, well, how, what do you mean? God just takes that gospel and deals with people's hearts, convicts their hearts. See? And they have a choice to accept or reject it. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. See, we have, we have the real gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The false cults and false religions, they knock on doors, and they give their false gospel and, uh, and so forth. But usually they don't even try to give their so-called gospel. What they try to do is, is get the people in their church, so-called church, first. All right, they usually have, like as I mentioned the other day, uh, they usually have like a little pamphlet, they have a nice looking guy and a nice looking woman on there and a couple little kids. And they say, would you like to come to our church? And we're having a thing about the, about the home and the family. Or we're having something on prophecy. You know, of course, prophecy is all fouled up doctrinally, but what they teach. But they, they get you, they get people in on that. And the average, as I mentioned, I'm not trying to be smart enough, but I'm just telling you, the average person in America don't read their Bible five minutes a year. So they, you know, they go here and there and they run all over the place. They don't read and study the Bible prior to, you know. So, they, they, so these cults knock on the door and they say, and they're all dressed up nice and everything, speak real nice and real mannerly and everything. They invite them out to their, their so-called church and they say, we're having a prophecy conference. We're having a uh, seminar on, you know, the home and the family and, and this and that. And we're having about, you know, how you can become a better person or, you know, this and that. They invite them out for that and they get them in there and they start on the doctrinal things about salvation. All right, look at Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, everyone, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
All right, so uh, notice the Jew first. So that gospel went to the Jew first, and they rejected it. And it goes to the Gentiles, I've mentioned many, many times. Uh, a shame of the gospel to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, in Habakkuk 2.4, you don't need to turn to it, I'll just, I'll just quote it for you. Habakkuk 2.4, the Bible says the just shall live by his faith. So it's the same thing in Romans 1.17. No, it's not. It says the just shall live by his faith. That's Old Testament. People say there's not a difference. If you could read second grade English, you can see there's a difference. Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by his faith. Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. <laughs> New Testament faith is a gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. Faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What Bob people think he's talking about that, you know, the salvation is you know, by the gift. He's talking about the faith. The faith is the gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, that faith, is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But in the Old Testament, the just shall live by his faith. Now, uh, in the Old Testament, all right, if you don't agree with this, that's fine. But in the Old Testament, under the law, there is an element of works connected with righteousness. You read the Old Testament, constantly it says, God says, if I will keep my commandments, if I will walk in my ways, if I will live, hundreds of verses. Read them. They're all through the Old Testament. All right? And uh, so uh, look, at, look at Romans 1, 6. Romans 1, 6. Among, uh, among whom ye are, are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. Uh, So much stuff here. I'm trying to find out the best way to figure out the best way to explain this to you. Uh, look, at, look at Romans chapter 10. I'll show you this. Look at Romans chapter 10. And let me show you the difference between Old Testament and New Testament faith or righteousness. Romans 10, Romans 10, 4. We'll get into this obviously later on when we get to chapter 10, but I'm, I want to show you this. Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. To everyone that get, gets baptized. No. For everyone that believeth. Now notice verse 5. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. Alright, this is Old Testament righteousness. Now look how Moses describes it. That the man which doeth, doeth, key word, doeth. You see that? See the second grade English? Doeth those things shall live by them. You see the doing, the works? But the righteousness which is of faith, that's us, New Testament, speaketh on this wise. See the difference? He made a difference. He made a contrast. Verse 5, Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. What is it, Moses? That the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Do, 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 do. You know what the Old Testament's full of? Do, 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 do. Works, works, works. Works, works, works. Works, works. If thou will keep my commandments, if thou shalt walk in my statutes and my judgments, if thou... Is that New Testament salvation righteousness? No. For by grace are you saved through faith. Look at verse 6. But, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ from again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, verse 8. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Look up here just for a minute. Every unsaved person has it right here. I'm dead. They got I'm dead. Verse 8 says, But what say the word is nigh, it's near, nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Mouth and my heart. I got it right there in the heart. That's it. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Every unsaved person's got it right there. But they'll say, I don't want to get saved today. I don't believe this is the time and place. Uh, I, I, I have every intention of getting, of getting saved and getting things right here one of these days. See, the devil gives people excuses. 
But the word is nigh. It's right there. It's in your heart and your mouth. See? Uh, so there's a difference there. All right. Now, let's go back to Romans 1. In the Old Testament, there's an element of works connected with righteousness. Uh, in Acts 10, uh, we're going over this, by the way, in, uh, in our study in Acts. But look at Acts 10.34. I want to show you this. Go back a few pages from Romans there. Look at Acts 10, 34. And I want to show you here about Cornelius. Cornelius was accepted because of his good works, but he wasn't saved. The word accepted has different definitions depending on where it's occur find, found in the Bible. Look at Acts 10, 34. Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But, verse 35, In every nation, here it is, Every nation. He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, everybody that's trying to get to heaven by good works knows where these verses are at and uses them. <coughs> and it looks like it's teaching that if you work good, have good works, and you're accepted by God, you'd go to heaven, right? The accepted doesn't mean you're accepted as far as salvation is concerned. The accepted, the accepted here. Look at verse 35. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with, uh, with him. Accepted has different terms. Uh, for example, in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul said, whether we labor, there, whether, we, uh, whether we live or, uh, let's see. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are whole in the body, we are absent from the word, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, willing, rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor... That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. That's talking about Christians, the judgment seat of Christ. Christians be accepted. Not being accepted in the sense of getting saved, you're already saved. It's talking about being accepted at the judgment seat and being God being pleased with you. You may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The word accepted doesn't always mean accepted in the sense of you're accepted as far as salvation. You get to go to heaven. All right? This here in Acts 10, this is Cornelius. His prayers have come up for memorial before God. We're going over on uh, Wednesday nights. And uh, the prayers have come up for a memorial before God, and he's accepted, and God's, uh, God has taken notice of him. He's, verse 2, a devout man. He fears God with all his house, gives much alms, and prays to God always. He saw in a vision, sees vision. He's of the Italian man. He'd make a perfect Roman Catholic. But he's lost as a goose. And God deals with Peter by getting the gospel to him. And Peter goes, and at the end of the chapter, Acts 10, him and his household all get saved. And they follow the Lord and believers, baptism by immersion. So what it says here in verse 35, but in every nation he that feareth him, Cornelius feared God, it says he feared God, and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Accepted in the sense that God's going to get the gospel to them. Not accepted, not working righteousness, and you get to heaven by your works. You see what I'm saying? See how people twist the scriptures? It, it, it says, uh, worketh righteousness. So here's what you have. Cornelius was accepted, not saved, was accepted because of his good works, but he wasn't saved. It put him in a position to be accepted, where God would send him the gospel, accepted in the sense that God's going to get the gospel to him. If Cornelius would have gone on and wouldn't have been feared God, gave alms, prayed, all these things here, Fear a just man, all it says, he's a good, righteous, moral man. But and God took notice his prayers come up for moral. In other words, God watches people. God watches people, and when that unsaved man is trying to seek God but is not saved, God will deal with a preacher, a Christian man, woman, a young person, a Christian witness, a soul winner, a missionary, you know, and knocking on doors or at the at the prisons or the jails or whatever it might be. He'll he'll deal with people. He has somebody. Uh, you say, how does God send people in these foreign countries and all these backwoods places? I don't know. God can do it any way he wants to do it. Genesis 6, 8 says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that's why God told Noah to build the ark. A lot of people think at that verse there that he found grace, that means he's saved. No. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because Genesis 6, 9 says Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Good works. Good works. So Noah worked righteousness. That's what Acts 10, 35 says. He works righteousness. And God said on the basis of that, on the basis of you working righteousness, Cornelius, Noah, and whoever else around the world, I'm going to get the gospel of that woman right there. She's seeking me. 
She's not saved. She's religious. She's trying to do her best. She thinks all these other things are going to get her to heaven, but I'm going to get the real gospel to her. God can do it. He can, uh, so God said on the basis of that, Noah, you can build the ark. The grace that God gave to Noah was the fact that God went to him on the basis of Noah working righteousness and told Noah how to save himself from the wrath of the flood. Being perfect in his generations didn't save Noah. It was building the ark and getting on the ark that saved Noah. You got to get on the ark. Working righteousness uh, 24 hours a day won't get it done. You, you get to get saved, to be accepted. As far as salvation is concerned, you have to see Acts 10, 4. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. He said, what is it, Lord? He said, and by prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. So God takes notice of that unsaved person, wherever they're at in the world. And God says, they are seeking me, but they're lost. And Cornelius was a good man, a devout man, a just man, feared God, prayed, saw visions. He was of the Italian band, make a perfect Roman Catholic. Not just a Roman Catholic, he'd make a perfect uh, self-righteous, uh, religious, good moral man. There's a lot of them all over America, all over the, all over the world. Yeah. But they, they need to be saved. They need the gospel. And uh, so that's the accepted there. Romans 1.17. Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Uh, notice the revealed things. Verse 17, God's righteousness is revealed to unregenerate people. His wrath is revealed to unregenerate, unsaved people uh, here in the, uh, uh, in the chapter or in the book of Romans. His truth is revealed to unregenerate people. In verse 19, things you can know about God is revealed. His power and Godhead are revealed in verse 20. His judgment is revealed down there in verse 32. So a lot of, uh, a lot of things are going to be revealed in the book of Romans. You got... Uh, uh, God's righteousness is revealed here in verse 17. His wrath is revealed down through the chapter here. The unsaved. His truth is revealed. Uh, 19 things you can know about God is revealed. His power and Godhead are revealed in verse 20. His judgment is revealed in verse 32. So John Calvin's teaching that an unregenerate, unsaved person can know nothing about God is absolutely false. It's absolutely false. And God reveals a lot of things in threes. I had a book on that years ago, and I loaned it to somebody. I never got it back. You ever stop thinking about threes? There's animal, vegetable, and mineral. There's up, middle, and down. There's left, middle, and right. There's red, blue, and green are the three basic colors. There's alpha, beta, and gamma rays. The sun has three basic kinds of rays, alpha, beta, gamma rays. There's light rays, heat rays, and act actinic rays. And Jesus Christ is said to be the sun, S-U-N of righteousness in Malachi 4. There's God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three. There's three races, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Man is a trichotomy, three. Every person is like a tricycle. It's got three wheels, all right? You're a live body, a live soul, and a dead spirit when you're born of your mother's womb. A live body, a live soul, and a dead spirit. What's got to be saved, quickened, regenerated is the spirit, the spirit in a, in a person. And uh, you have to be quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, 1 Timothy 5, 6. Dead. You say, I know a lot of unsaved people, sweet dear people, and they go to church and they're religious and they're nice and, and uh, they seem to be very intelligent, very smart. But the Bible says they're dead in trespasses and sins if they're not born again. So they need they got to be born again. they got to be saved, regenerated, born again, saved. All those words are used uh, simultaneously or, or you know, to mean the same thing. Uh, every person, uh, there's dust of the ground, body, breath of life, spirit, Man became a living soul. As I mentioned many times, give you a little illustration. I'll close here. I've got two minutes. Uh, anyways, uh, 
Every human being is like a football or basketball. You got the outer, you got the outer leather of the of the football or basketball. That's the flesh. When you look at we look at each other, we see our flesh, the outward of the human being. All right, and then inside that, right inside that, is like a bladder. It's usually like black or dark blue. If you cut, if you put a knife and puncture that basketball or that football and open it up, you'd see there's like a bladder in it. And it's the same shape as the outward flesh. It's right inside. It's the sh same shape. That's the soul. The soul. The soul has a bodily shape. We wanted this in Revelation. So the soul Remember those souls? That they, had, they had robes on in Revelation 6. A person dies and goes to hell. They're a soul, but they have a new body that never burns up. And when you go to heaven, if you're saved, you get a new body. And you never die. So uh, every person like a live body, a live soul, and a dead spirit. So right side is that bladder, that, which is the exact shape of the outward leather part. And then inside is the air. You, know, you put a pin in it or a knife in it, it goes, get flat. That air is the spirit. So every human being is a live body, a live soul, and a dead spirit. Uh, you got uh, past, present, and future. Three. You got width, depth, and breadth. All right. We'll stop for questions or comments. Any questions or comments? Anything at all that we discussed? Maybe I didn't make it clear or something. Anything? Father, we thank you.